Dear Cousin Josephine, I hope this email finds you well. I hope the red wine stains came out of your white sofa that Michael spilled at your party last week. I do miss you and my other cousins. Are you writing a letter? Oh, yeah, I'm writing an email to our cousin Josephine. Oh. Well, why aren't you just using the computer? Well, I am using the computer. I'm just using the steno machine as the keyboard. Ah. It's much faster. That is pretty genius, Richard. Well, what else could we do on this? Well, I mean, anything that you could do on a computer. I mean, just think if we did it all on the steno machine, how much faster we would be. Oh, that is brilliant. And if it's faster, we'd save more time, which means we could do more things like go to the movies and visit friends and go to parties. Michael, we do that anyway. Oh, right, we do, don't we? Oh, well, if it's faster, that means we'll save time and we'll have more time to squeeze in just one more party. I think that's pretty worth it, don't you think? Oh my gosh, I totally agree. Well, the person that's going to help us figure out how to do that is Ted Morin. So speaking of parties, let's get this party started. Since I first learned about steno, one thing has shocked me about stenographers. They go to school for years and spend thousands of dollars on education, CAT software, and steno machines. Yet, after they're done their day in the courtroom, or they're done their captioning, they go home and do their business, social media, writing emails, chatting, and all other computer usage on a far inferior machine that forces you to spell out letters one by one. I don't know about you guys, but I started caring a lot less for spelling words after I started learning steno. Of course, I'm still a stickler for proper spelling, but I put most of the mental load into building my dictionary properly, and then the steno software does the rest of the work. I'm not a professional stenographer. However, I probably use my steno machine more than the average court reporter does. I don't write at real-time speeds. I'm more around 170 words per minute, and I don't use conflicts, and I write clean. Again, unlike a professional stenographer, I almost never take down spoken word. Rather, I compose from my head. Also, I don't just write English. I use my steno machine full time at my job as a web developer. I write code using a steno machine daily. I wrote this talk using my steno machine. I write emails. I write prose. You get the idea. Anytime I do anything on my computer, I use my steno machine first. I'm really honored to be speaking to you today. When I first saw the list of speakers for StenoFest, my jaw dropped. So many of my Steno idols are here, and it's nearly unbelievable to me that I'm on a list with them. I want to give a huge kudos to Mark Greenberg for organizing everything and express a whopping thank you for allowing me to speak to you all today. My talk covers a lot of interesting and unconventional uses for Steno, so please post any questions you have into the chat below. Throughout the talk, Mark will be collecting and sending them to me. I'll aim to answer as many as I can in a QA section at the end, so please don't hold back. Today, I'm here to tell you why I think it's a great idea to use a steno machine for everything, both for people who currently use keyboards and for those who use steno machines. My name is Ted Morin, and I'm speaking today from Ottawa, Canada. I started learning steno in the summer of 2014 while I was in university in an effort to improve the ergonomics and speed of my work as a programmer. It didn't take long for me to fall in love with everything that's just so wonderful about stenography. And now I use my steno machine every day. I think using a steno machine instead of a keyboard is great. Steno machines allow you to write much faster than keyboards. You don't have to worry about simple spelling typos, and you don't have to waste time writing out a long word over and over again. It's more ergonomic, less tiring, and for me, much more satisfying. Nothing beats throwing out phrases or sequences of single symbols with a single stroke. In my free time, I'm a big promoter of Steno for daily use. I'm very involved in the Open Steno project, whose main goal is to get Steno out there to as many people as possible, all for free. It's trying a bottom-up approach to helping the profession of stenography grow. There's a shortage of court reporters and captioners going on. We have such a huge need, but very low engagement from high school students and, to top it off, a very high dropout rate. What that means to me is there's an issue where, firstly, people don't know what court reporters do or what stenography is, and secondly, people who do get interested 
don't really realize the amount of effort involved in becoming a stenographer, and so they drop out when the reality of the costs and effort become clear. Ideally, if more people knew what they were getting into, and more people were aware of the profession, we would have a more engaged student body that would be more likely to succeed through schooling. Open Steno is not about to solve the dropout problem, but what we aim to do is increase awareness of stenography and allow interested individuals to engage with the technology without needing an, a big investment. The upfront cost for getting into stenography, with exception to benevolent programs like NCRA Steno A to Z, are insane, like thousands for schooling, hundreds for a student machine, and lots and lots of research to do with respect to what Steno is and where to get free student Steno software. Open Steno wants stenography to be well known and a goal that can be achieved at home. No one will tell you that mastering a guitar is easy, yet teenagers all over the world pour hours and hours into their instruments and form bands and just generally live it up. No one will tell you that learning a language is easy, but so many will tell you that it's worth it. We have learning tools like Duolingo that bring content that was previously hard to find and hard to process into little lessons that are split up into five to 10 minute chunks. Learning how to use a steno machine has components of learning an instrument as well as a language. The practice and speed components are very similar to learning to play the piano, while the theory of shorthand is a lot like learning a language that is very similar to, but kind of uncomfortably different from English. Yet, if you want to learn an instrument, you don't have to buy a student version of one and go to college. You just buy a used one or borrow one from a friend. You go online and look at YouTube videos, or you just play with it at home and learn by ear. You can take lessons, sure. You can study music theory, sure. But it's a hobby, and there are lots of people that do it as a hobby. Like, lots of people. Who hasn't at least picked up a guitar to try it? How many people do you know who can play a song or two around a campfire? You don't need to use your guitar professionally to get good value out of the time that you put into it. Millions upon millions of people play guitar and don't make a cent off of it. I firmly believe that stenography can be the same. Stenography makes an excellent hobby, and the profession in general would do well from a large amateur population. The more people feel that stenography is approachable, the more people will try it, learn about it, and the people who have the right fit will join our profession. And even if they don't do it for work, either because they just can't get up to speed or they don't have great auditory processing abilities, they can still use the skills towards other work. Lots of, lots of jobs involve typing and the speed, ergonomic, and accuracy benefits that stenography offers are unmet by the standard keyboard. So that's a little bit of the mantra behind Open Steno. Our mission is to bring stenography to everyone, and that means anyone and everyone who wants to try it. The three ways that we've executed on that mission include writing free steno software, free learning materials, and creating access to really cheap hardware. The software is called Plover, and the founder and creator of Open Steno, Open steno and Plover is Mira by Night. I hope you didn't miss her excellent talk yesterday, where she made a case against the fear-mongering opinion that stenographers will be wiped out by machines. So, in the Open Steno mission, there's cheap hardware. Steno machines generally aren't cheap. The only cheap steno machines I've ever found were government surplus on classifieds because I live in Ottawa near the Canadian Parliament buildings. To really make steno approachable, it has to be easier than learning what a computerized steno machine is and then trying to find one locally. Instead, Plover lets people repurpose regular computer keyboards for use as a steno machine. In addition to that, the open steno community has innovated and created many DIY and budget keyboards. They often have cutesy names and they truly are cute little machines. Though I own a few professional machines, including the Lightspeed Classic, Infinity Ergonomic, and an old Elan Cybra, I do opt to use a DIY machine for reasons that I'll explain later. The gap between a $150 DIY keyboard and a professional steno machine is definitely closing for people like me, who don't get a lot of use out of standard luxury features such as audio pass-throughs, recording, and backups. We also produce free learning materials. There are many free drilling resources, theory books, and tools that we offer to anyone to learn for free. I'm writing my own online textbook, artofcording.com, but we also have QWERTY Steno and Learn Plover. 
For drilling tools, there's Typey Type and Steno Jig. I spend a lot of time learning how to get better at Steno from typing drilling websites as well, which aren't even made for Steno. So the thing is that for Steno to be taken up like a guitar, it needs to be useful like a guitar. You have to want to get good at it. You have to want to use it. With a Steno machine, if your goal is to be a court reporter or a captioner, your goal is a career. And that's not what people are usually thinking about when they're learning to play their favorite songs on a guitar. And just the same, I feel that there needs to be a reason for people to learn steno casually. Becoming a rock star just won't cut it. What's the steno equivalent of standing around the campfire with your friends and singing Sweet Caroline? Steno is awesome technology that I feel has probably had some stunted growth. In order for it to be better known and truly useful to everyone, it has to be able to compete with keyboards and provide enough value over them that the time investment that goes into learning Steno is actually worth it. In order to provide mass appeal, we need to demonstrate that Steno can be used for more than just a career and that it's better than the keyboard. And for teaching Steno, we need to do more than just teach basic theory and then drill over and over and over and over again. While repetition and perfect practice will make perfect, it can do it at the cost of joy. Machine shorthand is fascinating stuff, and anyone who tells you differently is wrong. Bending our language into this compressed form and learning how to communicate that through strokes on a keyboard is just really nerdy and cool. I was really happy to hear Ed and Melanie encouraging short bursts of practice in their talks yesterday. Learning steno is a process of discovery, and I feel that in general it's really hard to communicate how cool it really is to someone who's just trying to get good at it. There are a lot of innovative teaching techniques that we could bring to Steno, and I think that a lot of learners probably already use these without even knowing. Beyond just learning theory and practicing, these are some of the tips that I give to new learners who are self-teaching themselves through Open Steno. One, keep your theory close. Install a dictionary lookup app on your phone. Whenever you're going about your daily life and you encounter words, think about how you would write them. And if you're not sure, look it up on your phone. Label everything. Label household items with the outline for them. Many language learners do this, and I think it would be beneficial for people to label their doors with TKAOR. Use outlines. Try reading and writing in raw outlines. It's not fast, but it reinforces the theory you're learning, giving you recall and recollection benefits. Taking this one step further, a friend named Kevin Knox invented a way to actually pen machine shorthand notes on paper, which he can then read back. It's somewhere between longhand and Greg in terms of speed, but it helps him keep his brief straight when he's, whether he's on his paper or his machine. Teach someone the basics. Trying to regurgitate the information you're learning, either through a blog post or by showing your mom, is a really good way to solidify concepts. The questions your learners will ask will expose your blind spots and help you build an even more solid foundation. Keep your practice interesting. Practice with material that you're interested in. If you intend to use Steno to write emails, then try writing emails. If you're bored of your learning material, try copying down an article from a journal or magazine you really like about a subject that fascinates you. Try chatting online with friends. Listen to a podcast or audio you enjoy at two times speed to improve your auditory processing skills. Build your personal dictionary. Start building your own dictionary early and often, even if you make mistakes. As long as it's in a job dictionary, you can revisit strokes that weren't in the best taste after you've learned more. Not letting yourself explore your intuitions and fail early stunts the brain's curiosity and neurological pathway development. In that job dictionary, define briefs for the words that you use most often. Everybody's different, and we all have some favorite words that we want to keep ready at our fingertips. When I started learning, one of my first briefs was for coffee. Keep everything running. As much as possible, keep your machine and software easy to access. Even if it's remotely a chore to start up your steno machine, that will hinder the number of opportunities that you take to practice, which will slow down your progress greatly. One of my favorites, air steno. Steno on your lap. Steno people's names as you meet them. Try stenoing words in the conversation you're listening to. Steno in bed as you drift to sleep. Steno on the bus while you listen to a podcast. 
I found that some of my biggest speed increases in plateau breakings were after sessions where I wasn't writing on my machine at all. Learn party tricks. Half the fun of having a super sophisticated tool with a century of history is making it write supercalifragilisticexpialidocious with a single stroke. Learn party tricks, show your friends, and just feel the joy. Don't over-practice. Don't practice if you feel bored. Don't create a negative association between your steno machine and your mood. Can you imagine if you did that throughout your school and then your whole career just reminded you of how much you hated that time? And finally, relatedly, love what you do. Everyone finds joy in different parts of any hobby, profession, career, and you should find yours with steno. Whether it's ergonomic benefits, speed, or the idea of a lucrative career that makes you tick, focus on it. Feel good about what you do. Yesterday I saw somebody embody this in the StenoFest chat. Dana Spear wrote, I think stenography is the closest thing to a superpower. I'm just a student, but I like to tell people that I'm working on my superpower instead of practicing. Dana, I think that's a fantastic way to look at it. Keep your mind in a positive mindset and you will succeed. So I guess a lot of what I'm saying is just that I'm tired of the narrative that if you're not the most diligent student, you'll never be good enough. And I take just as much issue with the thought that any speed below 225 is a failure. If someone used to type at 40 words per minute, and now they write on their steno machine at 120, that's a threefold improvement, and yet a traditional school would see that individual as a failure. I see people beating themselves up on the Encouraging Court Reporting Students Facebook page despite passing their 200s. While I know we need people who can do 225 plus, and we need people who can do real time, I think there's a huge opportunity for people who fail at school to use their skills. If you finish with 170 words per minute, your ability as a transcriptionist is miles ahead of any typist. You can get so much more done, so much more ergonomically than a typist, or even multiple typists taking shifts. Even if you leave the field completely, you can end up performing data entry, taking down meeting notes, writing emails, or so many other tasks that a steno machine can make much easier. Okay, so a question. Let's talk about what the members of Open Steno think. Every year we run a community survey, and we received 103 responses in 2018. I'd like you to guess. What did most people say that they plan to use their steno machines for? Was it offline transcription, real-time captioning, writing prose, email, and blogging, or writing code? The answer really surprised me. What most of these people were putting hours and hours into learning steno for was simply writing prose, email, and blogging. A clear winner at 60%. We had twice as many members choosing this option over offline transcription or real-time. The top three choices in the survey are all activities that you'd usually perform on a regular keyboard. What this tells me is that we're definitely changing at least some people's perceptions of what Steno could be. This means the pool of people who may consider learning Steno is greater, and it means we may find the next Steno speedster without even trying. I'm going to talk briefly about how I got exposed to Steno. I was reading the typing profile of one of the fastest typists in the world, Sean Rona. He offhandedly mentioned that he didn't cheat or use anything like Plover technology. I clicked through to learn what Plover was, and that brought my attention to Mirabai's blog. I was intrigued by the supposed speed and ergonomics, and I knew I had to try it for myself. When I was learning Steno, I used an ergonomic keyboard that I had built for programming. It was far from the ideal steno machine, but luckily learners don't need a featherlight touch to be successful. I was learning steno in my free time between studying software engineering in university and internships. It took me about eight months of casual learning to get to 80 words per minute, which nearly met my typing speed of 100 words per minute. By this point, steno was addictive and I just wanted to do it, even if it was a little slower. By the time I hit 120, over a year in, I decided that I would try programming in Steno. That took a whole long time to get used to, and Plover had to be improved from a software standpoint, standpoint to support some of my workflows, but two years in and I could write code with my Steno machine. I had also hit 150 words per minute at that point. From there, I've been pretty content and haven't consciously tried to improve my speed. 
The closest things I do to, to deliberate practice are taking meeting notes, transcribing podcasts, and playing type racer. I'm really happy with my speed, even though I do feel like I could improve further. Nothing about Steno was particularly easy or natural for me, especially when it came to going cold turkey. There were many challenges that I had little guidance on how to overcome. I'd like to share some of the lessons I learned with you today, though luckily I don't have to teach any of you Steno. The question is how to take full advantage of your Steno machine. If we take a traditional court reporting route, there's no class explaining us how to use the Steno machine outside of the context of transcription. So let's dive in. Usually when I give talks about Steno, I have to spend a lot of time convincing the audience that stenography is even a good idea. Thankfully, this is StenoFest and not KeyCon, meaning I don't have to sell you on anything. If you're here, you already know that stenography is fast, ergonomic, and truly an art and skill worth learning. I think stenography is genuinely wonderful, and learning it is one of the best decisions I've ever made. Since I don't have to convince you that stenography is worth learning, I have to instead convince you that it's so good that it's worth completely replacing your keyboard. That involves outlining the discomforts and barriers that a stenographer might face when trying to use their steno machine instead of a keyboard, because most computers are, naturally, designed for keyboard usage. We need to bend and adjust how we use the steno machine to match that model a little better. One of the benefits that I think a lot of stenographers will appreciate from a professional development perspective is that using your steno machine outside of work will reinforce your theory, help build vocabulary in your dictionaries, and help build real-time writing skills. Your ability to use Steno for non-work purposes will also help you with recruiting new members to the profession. The more that you can still sell stenography as this general use tool and not just a discipline, the more interesting it'll be to other people. How to do it. The first challenge we have to overcome is breaking the barrier of your Steno software. In order to use your Steno machine for general computer usage, your software needs to forward the output to other programs. Most CAT software lets you use your Steno machine outside of the transcription window. I personally use Plover, and in Plover there is no transcription window. The only mode is writing into other programs, so if you're using Plover, you're good. If you're a Case Catalyst user, there's a feature called Steno Keys, which will forward your real-time translation to any program on your computer, which is perfect. Advantage Eclipse's external writing feature is called Keyboard Macro, and in Digital Cat, it's called Catnip, which is adorable. I won't go over the details of setting each of these up, but be sure to check your user guide or just give the support team a call. Once you've turned on Catnip, Keyboard Macro, Steno Keys, or Plover, you should hide the main cat window or reduce it to a paper tape display or whatever widgets and helpers you're used to having open while writing. You want it out of the way so you can just focus on your output. If you've never tried it before, I recommend trying to write without any Steno-related windows open. Just keep the Steno between you and your machine, no software in sight. It might feel a little weird, but there's a sense of comfort in the silence and invisibility of having no CAT software visible. I also might be crazy, so take that advice with a grain of salt. Okay, now you're connected to your software, your machine is waiting for input, and you've opened up Notepad, or Microsoft Word, or Google Docs, or Facebook, and you're just staring at a blank cursor. Here's where I think the hardest part is for a stenographer who's new to using their steno machine for computer usage. Most of what you do in your job with a steno machine is listening to people, taking down what they're saying at breakneck speeds, and moving on. I've heard from court reporters and captioners that if they're bored or uninterested in the material, they can largely tune it out and only maintain the buffer to get the correct words out while ignoring the meaning. That's all well and good, but when you're sitting alone at home with no one talking, you need to start composing from your head. This might affect your speed, might affect your accuracy. Don't worry about it. It's completely normal. Where usually you're able to focus most of your brain power on writing, now you're also dedicating some of it to actually thinking about what you need to write. You'll need to build up some tolerance to thinking as you write and basically captioning your own thoughts as they come through. It's easiest to start writing emails, maybe chatting on Facebook Messenger, something casual where you have time to edit and you won't be stressed if you need to take a break and start working on dictionary building. The other thing that won't really fly here is conflicts. Unless you're really confident in your software's AI, conflicts can be problematic for real time. 
because we're just writing little messages uh, or prepping small emails, we can't go back and fix incorrect spelling conflict picks afterwards. Globaling outside of a transcription window doesn't really work either. For this reason, we need to address misstrokes and untranslates and invalid conflict selections as soon as possible, I'd say as soon as they happen. I'm of the opinion that removing conflicts entirely from any real-time style writing is the best way to solve this problem, but if you do insist on using conflicts, just know that you'll have to pay attention to the output and make sure your software is doing its job. So speaking of dictionary building, what happens the first time you post on social media with your steno machine about how much you hate that they start playing Christmas music at the beginning of November? Obviously, you'll need to throw in a few exclamation marks at the end of the status update or tweet to really drive home the point. Heck, you might want to throw on a few angry emoji to really share how you're feeling. And that's where symbols come into play. I've met court reporters who've told me that they didn't have an exclamation mark in their writing dictionary because their style guide at work forbids their usage for the obvious reason that you can't actually say that someone spoke with an exclamation mark in English. This is mostly fine, but for regular computer users, you'll want all the symbols that you're used to having on a keyboard, and then some. See, a lot of the symbols we use on a day-to-day -day basis, like the at symbol, exclamation mark, and the number symbol, are used so commonly because they're right there on the standard 104 key keyboard layout. If you don't want to be put at a disadvantage compared to a regular keyboard, you should make sure you have at least the standard symbols present on a keyboard defined in your dictionary. So in addition to the aforementioned dollar, in addition to the aforementioned, there's the dollar symbol, percent, caret, ampersand, asterisk, dash, plus, parentheses, square brackets, curly braces, angle brackets, the digits 0 through 9, the tilde, back tick, single quotes, double quotes, and the semicolon. So where braces brace, for me, BRS is open curly brace, and the same stroke asterisk is closed curly brace. I follow this pattern for parentheses, square brackets, curly braces, and angle brackets. Okay, great. So after some time playing with your dictionary and identifying common pitfalls, you're able to write more or less at the same level as if you were on a keyboard. You can use parentheses and hashtags and everything you need. If any of the symbols on the slide earlier aren't in your dictionary, consider whether you'd actually use them and add them if you don't have them. I'm sure some of them are already there. If you don't have any fingerspelling dictionaries yet, now's the time to get one, get used to it, and be able to work through weird words that you've never encountered before. Fingerspelling is a staple of real-time editing, so hopefully most of you will have that already. Another question. True or false? Steno isn't as good for general computer usage because it has fewer keys than a keyboard. You probably already know where this is going, but false. Forget about the 104 keys on the keyboard. We're on a Steno machine. And the Steno machine has one amazing property that a keyboard definitely doesn't. Millions upon millions of unique strokes and infinity ways to combine them. A typist has to work with about 100 keys and only three or four modifiers, whereas we have much more space to work with. Here's how many unique single strokes you can perform on a computer keyboard compared with how many unique single strokes you can perform on a Steno machine. On the keyboard, you have four modifiers, of which you can use none, one, two, three, four. Think at the high level, Control, Shift, Alt, Windows key, and then A. And you can use those modifiers with the 100 different keys, and so you end up with 100 times 4 to the 2, or roughly 16,000 different single strokes. With Steno, you only have 24 functional keys to work with if you count the main layout, plus one for the asterisk, and one for the number bar. However, Unlike with a keyboard, there are no explicit modifiers, but rather every key can be part of a chord, and so you have 2 to the 24 possible strokes, or 16 and a half million. So with Steno, you have at the theoretical level a thousand times more option at your disposal. For every single action on the keyboard, we have a thousand. That's just insane to think about. We're not even counting the possibilities when we start combining strokes together. I'm just talking single strokes. That's a lot of possibilities, and while it's not limitless, it's basically limitless. Wow. So what this means, practically, is that we don't have to limit ourselves to what's on a keyboard. The keyboard has symbols, has letters, has numbers, and you can press backspace and tab and access function keys. 
But you can do all that on your steno machine, every action in one stroke if you're clever, but we can also do so much more. We can use symbols, emoji, and sequences of those with our steno machine. In Plover, full symbol support comes built in. If you put emoji and other symbols in your dictionary, they just work. I'm not as aware of other steno software, but presumably if they don't support Unicode and symbols, they should be able to add it in future versions. For example, you might map a steno stroke to a smiley like laugh, or you could map an emoji, stuck out tongue, or even a symbol, sequence of symbols for the shrugging ASCII art. Why settle for things like cliche, a la carte, and cafe when you could put little diacritics on those suckers? The possibilities are literally endless. Macros are really cool too. A stenographer doesn't have to think about capitalization in the same way that a normal typist does. For proper names or stylized brand names, our dictionaries do the heavy lifting. The Steno software has some understanding of how punctuation affects capitalization, meaning that we don't have to waste any of our brain space thinking about whether the Y in New York is capital or not. It just happens. And macros, I feel, are a great extension of this. Because we're not in control of things letter by letter, we need macros to help us out. If we want to place something in quotes, bold it, stitch it with hyphens, whatever, it's nice to have a macro to do that. With Plover, we recently added a plugin system, which basically means that any developer can develop new features for the software and people can download and install them on their own. It's made some really creative stuff come to light. We have all sorts of interesting macros that I wouldn't have necessarily thought of myself. Here are some macro ideas. We have strokes to enable, disable, and reorder job dictionaries on the fly, even to change the current keyboard layout if you're a crazy stenographer who can do multiple languages. Macros to repeat the last stroke, the last word, and the last sentence. We have a macro to write whatever's in your clipboard through your machine without actually using your computer's paste shortcut, which would make it asterisk or undoable. We have a macro to turn a normal word into a whining one. For example, when you're talking to your coworker about your micromanaging boss, you might want to write, he's so annoying. And this macro will add the extra O's randomly to the so. And one that I made takes your previously written words and replaces them with the appropriate emoji. So, for example, I could write man, man, boy, girl, then moj, my conversion stroke, and out comes the emoji. This works in any window on my computer. I love it. And I put emoji in all sorts of places that they don't really belong, like hotel reservation forms. The next problem you'll probably encounter is that a lot of your day-to-day -day strokes like new paragraph don't carry over to other programs. You'll need to define strokes that map to keyboard return, backspace, delete, tab, and shift tab. You'll want to have your keyboard's movement cluster like page up, page down, home, end, and all the arrow keys. It's not trivial to do all of this, but I really recommend it. Once you've got movement keys down, you can even scope your own transcripts using your steno machine which is like stenoing while you steno. I'll share what I use for my movement keys because I think it's pretty intuitive, and for someone who hasn't tried this out before, it can be a daunting task to figure it all out. I extended a method I learned from Plover's dictionary. For moving around the document, you always hold STPH and make a combination with the right hand. On the screen, you can see on the right side, the RPBG, that represents the arrow cluster, where R is left, P is up, B is down, G is to the right, and that'll move one character at a time. But because we're on a steno machine, we don't have to limit ourselves to single keys. RB would represent control left, which will skip one word to each direction, whether you use RB or BG. And also, if you want to move to the beginning or the end of the line, I use this cluster and make motions. FPL means home to the beginning of the line. RBG means end to the end of the line. If I want to scroll up really fast, I use page up. And to do that, I just form a little arrow in my cluster where RPG kind of looks like an upwards facing arrow, FBL looks like a down facing arrow. And sometimes your goal isn't to navigate around your text, but rather to select it. And I use all the previously mentioned keys while holding shift on my computer to select text. So for this, I instead use the bottom row of the left hand instead of the top row. SKWR instead of STPH, and using any of the aforementioned combinations, I can select text. Let's see this in action. 
In this video, I'm moving around a document. I move character by character, word by word, home, end, page up, page down. Notice every stroke includes STPH because I'm not selecting anything. After I get where I want to be, I start using my SKWR strokes to move around in the same way and select text, character by character, word by word, end, page down. You get the idea. So now I've got a bunch of selected text and presumably because I want to copy or cut it. Let's do that. For copying and pasting, we can either use the mouse or you'll see where this is going. Continue using our steno machines. For keyboard shortcuts, it's just a matter of mapping a stroke to whatever shortcut you need. The strokes will translate to the keyboard shortcut control X and you can use whatever you like, whether that's a mnemonic for cut like KUT or something resembling control X like KLX, you're good. I've also seen systems where assuming that you can fingerspell an entire alphabet on your left hand, you can use various right hand combinations to form the modifiers that you'd want to use. When getting around the computer, it's useful to have shortcuts that enable you to do the things you'd usually do on a keyboard. This includes tabbing around a form uh, and having undo map to a stroke, the escape key, all sorts of stuff. In Plover, you can even use media keys. I use my steno machine to control screen brightness, control music, and change the volume. There's also a lot of stuff you might need to write on a computer that you don't necessarily have to write day to day on your machine. For, for one, website URLs could be a concern. You can't brief every URL, so it's useful to have a set of tools to build them up. Using macros, you can create HTTP and HTTPS strokes that turn off spacing, enable lower casing, I have strokes for www, the main domain endings, .com, .org, .ca, .co uk and slashes. Then it's just a matter of writing them out one by one. And that's why I find writing URLs to be pretty satisfying on a steno machine. They just kind of appear. Additionally, if you're used to using ChatSpeak online, you'll want to define a good set of strokes to capture your favorite non-words. You may ask, lol, but why though? And to that, I just say that between emoji and ChatSpeak, there's this whole body language to speaking online that many people wouldn't want to let go of if they switched to steno. Showing them the ability to write these informal words eases their worries about losing their own culture. Bringing all this together, I can finally start talking about how I go about coding on my steno machine. I should mention that I'm pretty used to coding on my steno machine. I've done it every working day for years now, and I wouldn't change it for the world. But a warning where it's due, it doesn't look like captioning. Coding isn't a speed contest, and there's no one feeding me what to write. It all comes from the mind, and often quite slowly. You'd think that, if speed doesn't matter in coding, why steno code at all? I used to ask myself that a lot, especially when I was trying to self-teach myself steno, and it was a royal pain in the butt. But I stuck with it, and after a while, it became more normal for me to write code in steno than on my keyboard, and I think I can tell you why it's so much nicer. It's actually very similar to English. When typing English, you spell every word, you type every letter. In steno, you think in word parts, in words and phrases, and it feels much more like speaking. Just the same, everything is programmed in logical chunks of characters that have some useful meaning to the computer. So when coding, there are lots of little pseudo-words that are made up of symbols. All in one stroke, I can produce double equals, which is an equality check. Double pipes, which gives a logical OR operator. Open and close parentheses, a common way to initiate another piece of code to run. Or even this console.log, which is a function I use a lot. Also. English is still all over the code. There are words everywhere in code, especially in comments. The speed of steno to write English is better than on a keyboard. And the main problem that I've had to overcome with coding is that spacing in code is much harder than English. Where in English spaces always come after words except around punctuation, it's much more annoying in coding. There are lots of cases where the same symbols may or may not have spaces after or before them. For me to handle that, I've had to develop a pattern. 
For brackets, there can be parentheses, square brackets, curly braces, and angle brackets. I already talked about my basic version for all the brackets, but it goes further and that I have a spaced and non-spaced version for all my brackets. The strokes look like what you see on the screen. I usually start with something like pren or bracket, and then I start removing keys when I want to indicate that I don't want the space anymore. The reason that I need this is if you look at the examples at the bottom, um, the open square bracket in the first line has a space before it, but not after it. The one in the second line has no space on either side, and the one in the third line has a space on both sides. Now isn't that just annoying? So now I'm going to show a little demo of me writing in JavaScript, and we'll see how it's a little bit different, but still largely the same as writing in English. So I start out by making this green text, which is a comment, which lets future me or other programmers know what's going on. Then I declare a function, a piece of code that can be invoked at a later time. In it, I take an event variable, which could be anything. I assemble a string of text using the event variable, throwing an emoji in there for good measure. Then I console.log the message, which will cause it to be the program's output. Another comment will go to remind myself to improve this message later. And finally, I invoke the function with the intended event name. This is a working program. Next up, I decide I want to change where the console.log happens for some reason, and so I use my movement keys to go refactor the code. And there you have it, a small function like I'd be writing in my day-to-day -day work. It's nothing special to me now, but a lot of people tell me that it's not possible to code with a steno machine. I guess people should have told me that before I went and did it. I talked earlier about the fact that Open Steno community has come up with some cute and clever little machines to offer to, to potential amateurs, and that I actually use these instead of a professional grade machine day to day. The reason that our DIY machines are so much cheaper is because the underlying technology and features are different from a traditional steno machine. For one, we don't need any recording or backup features, because all of our computer writing is computerized and real-time. There's no record to preserve when you're just chatting online. So the first cost cut is in features. No screen, no memory, only a USB port. The next cost cut is in the mechanism. While nothing beats the touch of a light lever, the mechanism is quite expensive. So instead of using a lever system, DIY Steno has opted to use mechanical switches found in high-end gaming keyboards. These switches only cost 30 cents to a dollar a piece, so for a full keyboard, the cost is very reasonable. The disadvantage, of course, is the feel. These also tend to be a lot harder to press down than a normal lever machine. To combat this, we've been working with parts manufacturers to develop springs that are much light, lighter than is practical for normal typing. The result is a myriad of custom devices. This is a plank, a mini mechanical keyboard that has just the right amount of columns in order to use with steno. It wasn't designed for steno though. This is the steno mod, which is the first community made machine that offered a low actuation force right out of the box. This is the soft love. It's the first community made machine with molded keycaps specifically made to adapt mechanical keyboard technology to Steno. And this is a prototype of the Georgie, an unreleased keyboard so far, and it's the first one that I've seen that's being offered for under $100 assembled. It has a feather light touch and a super portable form factor. The thumb keys are programmable with the thought that the extra thumb key on each hand would act as your number bar. There are a few reasons why I use a DIY keyboard instead of a real machine. One is size. The real machines mounted on tripods are excellent for transcription, but as a computer user, I swap between writing and mousing very often, which is unergonomic when your machine raises 15 centimeters off your desk, and then you have to go to move down to the mouse, bat on the shoulders, or when the machine is down below and between your knees on the tripod, and you need to raise up to a mouse. The other thing is LEDs. I just love it when my keyboard is shining. And hackability. The Open Steno community comes up with these new innovations and takes on the classic Steno design. And without the ability to modify your hardware, it can feel like you're getting left behind. Here's a photo of my most recent Steno machine build with lots of LEDs. 
I've had a few thoughts on how to expand the types of strokes on a steno machine. Right now, a stroke is very easily defined as the sum of keys pressed before all keys are released. Some of the common pitfalls that I found when switching to a steno machine full-time involved things that you do on computers that you wouldn't really do in a courtroom. For example, if you're moving up a document one arrow key at a time, that's a huge amount of typo-prone stroke, typo strokes. For me, that's STPHP for the up arrow, and if I have to move up a page or two, it's like a lot of repeated strokes. It's tiring and much harder than just holding a key like you would on a keyboard. So one solution I've had is a macro that repeats the last stroke. I think this is so useful that I mapped it to the bare number bar. So anything I write, like an up arrow, I just start tapping the number bar and it goes up and up and up. And that's all fine of dandy, but it's still a lot of key presses. So I was wondering how you would bring key holding into the stenoverse without things getting too weird. Key hold repeat works on keyboards, but doesn't really make sense on steno most of the time. You could hold a stroke for a few reasons in steno. Sometimes you get stuck on a stroke because you're thinking slowly, or you're anticipating a phrase and so you wait on the speaker. And having hold repeat in this case could be destructive. My solution is basically double tap and then hold. You stroke once, repeat it immediately, hold. It's okay to do the stroke twice because the intention when you hold is to do it a whole bunch. Then after a short period of time, the steno machine starts repeating the stroke, and bam, look at how this works out in practice. I show me writing with my movement keys here, and then I use the number bar to repeat my last stroke. Next, I double tap and hold the number bar to continue my last stroke over and over and over. And I can do this with any chord I want. I don't just have to limit it to single keys. This feature would have to be implemented in your Steno Machines firmware because the software can't receive the inputs necessary. And this works with any stroke. It's fun to yell a word over and over, and it's also useful if you want to delete a whole paragraph you just wrote. You just double tap and repeat the asterisk. The other problem I wanted to solve was that as you're moving around with your arrow keys or whatnot, your right hand is providing the useful input, and the left hand is just mashing the whole top row without much utility. One thought I had was another version of key holding. The idea is that when finger spelling or using movement keys, you hold down the part of the chord that's common to every stroke, wait a little, and then start writing with your other fingers. Here I demonstrate finger spelling with an over-exaggerated asterisk in every stroke. Ne then I hold down the asterisk, which act activates the mode, and I fingerspell with only my left hand. Then I demonstrate the same thing with my movement keys. Holding down the top row, I can just use my right hand as if I were using a computer keyboard cluster, but with more actions available to me. Okay, this has been a lot of stuff. A lot of new stuff. And even though I live with this stuff all day, every day, it still feels like a lot to me. In my short time since I began learning Steno four years ago, I've seen huge advancements and innovations in Steno and its uses. I feel like as more and more intelligent people get their hands on the technology, it will grow and expand in ways we can't quite fathom. I think there are a lot of exciting things coming to Steno in the grand scheme of things, and it's not even going to be from the sources that we'd expect. We see new minds tinkering and experimenting and challenging accepted truths, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I actually find that the number of people who come through Open Steno forums just trying to gather information is pretty high. So a true or false question. The Open Steno project takes people away from court reporting schools, online programs, or things like Steno A to Z. I'm going to go with false. So. Lots of students come through Open Steno just wanting to chat with a real working stenographer and asking them questions. They're delighted when they get candid answers. We help people navigate what the difference is in Steno theories so they can decide whether they want to follow Magnum Steno, learn Phoenix, visit their local Stened school, join Simply Steno, or self teach. Sometimes people learn enough about Steno and just decide that it's not for them, in which case we've saved them from having to drop out of school. In our 2008 community survey, 
about 25% of respondents said they had enrolled in a steno program or were intending to do so. We also get people who are about to go into the steno A to Z program or those who have just completed it and want to know more. So really we're just a stepping stone on the path towards the goal. Our, sc our scope is also very broad. OpenSteno sees a large number of learners looking to write languages other than English, which is a very different market than what North American schools are going after. Lots of the exotic machines that Dom pointed out in the gallery of shorthand talk still exist, but with very hard to find schooling, and we help those people connect and learn together. And finally, we get loads of people who have zero interest in the career aspect and just want to try out Steno for themselves. People who just learn it as a tool, like me, may pivot into the field when they discover they have a knack for it, and often that involves transitioning into a domain-specific training program. So, I really like Steno. I think there's a huge potential market for amateur stenographers like me who could promote the field. Lots of my friends have no idea what a Steno machine is, how it works, or even that court reporters still exist, and I think that's a shame. I think it's sad that there's such huge upfront costs for Steno for most people, and I think it's sad that most people who have the skills to use their Steno machine professionally don't use it casually. I think it's a bummer that someone could get to 180 words per minute and consider themselves a total failure. I think we would do well with a shift in attitude. Steno doesn't have to be expensive, it doesn't have to be hard, and it doesn't have to be a career. It's a wonderful technology, and I firmly believe there's value in it, even if you never break 80 words per minute, let alone 180. I still think there's a place for brick and mortar schools, for online schools, as well as for self-teaching. Every student is different and their financial situation paired with their personal interests and work ethic will largely affect where they'll end up. We have to stop with the idea of a blanket solution for every person because that's just never the case in life. There's no one style of shoe, no flavor of coffee, no form of transportation that we can all agree on. Education is the same. What works for one person may not work for another, and we need to acknowledge and embrace these differences. People come through and try self-teaching with Open Steno, then they find that they want a traditional school instead. I think that's a very healthy and good thing. Your machine is truly your best friend. The relationship you have with your dictionary is closer than most friendships. It's hard to overstate how much of your brain is changed and enhanced when you learn Steno, and yet most of us go back to typing at the end of the day. I encourage you to try using your steno machine in more places. It's not always comfortable and it's not always easy, but it's always fun. If you know people who you think would benefit from using steno, but they don't have the right opportunities to pursue a classical education model, send them over to openstenoproject.org. I hope you learned a lot today and it's been a pleasure speaking to you all. I'll be checking questions at this time. Oh, there are a lot of them. <laughs> Let's see. Any ideas how I can navigate from text field to text field on websites and emails using a steno machine? Yeah, so usually when you're navigating text fields, you want to use tab and shift tab. Your software should have some kind of keyboard shortcut creator to do this. And I use tab with an asterisk and stab with an asterisk, meaning shift tab to go back. Have you always been a techie? I feel like I'm not. Do I have a shot at doing this? That's a great question, and I feel like Techiness certainly helps at this point. Definitely our goal is to make it non-technical friendly, but it could be difficult at this point. If you're already using Case Catalyst or other software, they should be help they should be able to help you set up CaseCat to do all this stuff too. Did you ever consider becoming a court reporter? That's a pretty good question, and I think that if I had learned about court reporting back when I was in high school, I would have considered it much more. By the time I learned about Steno, I was always in, already in my second year of software engineering, and I really enjoyed it, so I didn't really consider taking on anything like that. But I do do transcription in my free time when I'm in the mood to earn an extra buck. Can you please give us an example of a code string? I think I did that. I'm a captioning student interested in learning to use Plover. I attempted to learn on my own. Which text editor? should I use to be able to see my notes and the text. So Plover has a notes feature built in, which you can just open, it's called the paper tape, and you can leave it on top of other windows. Whatever you write into is your choice. I think Microsoft Word and Google Docs are both good choices. 
especially if they have cloud backup, so you won't lose anything if your computer runs out of batteries. What's the difference between what's mapped in Catalyst software compared to Plover? There's a big difference, actually, between um, what the output looks like. Every software will have their own user manual, and you just need to look into that to find out. Do you have a special macro for Alt-Tab to switch between programs and Windows? Other macros work well, but this one will not work for me. So this might be more of a Plover specific question. For Alt-Tab, I use the mnemonic tab T, so tab alt is basically what's going on inside my head. And in Windows, we found that we needed to do Alt-Tab-Tab tab to get it to work, as Alt-Tab wasn't working. We do plan to address this in a future version of Plover where we'll support key holding, which is what you'd need to do in Windows to hold Alt and then just lightly tap Tab. Can you use Plover to connect to an encoder? No, not at this time. And I think that the software that exists for that, whether you're using Eclipse or CaseCat, they're really fantastic and it's probably worth paying for their support, especially when you're dealing with encoders, which can be finicky. How do you see Steno mods evolving? Machines 10 years from now. I think that <laughs> that's, that's a great question. And 10 years is way beyond the horizon I can think of because it's been four years since I started learning and the machines available when I started were kind of trash and I really didn't like any of the cheaper DIY options. And just in this past year, we've gone from an actuation force, meaning when the key registers of 35 grams now down to like 10 grams, which is insane to me. It's such an intense rapid progress. Just last night, someone was talking in the community about building their own lever machine um, from parts that they have lying around their house. So I really don't know where things will go. I think we'll see a lot of alternative layouts, uh, like split S's, split asterisk, using those in your theory. And we'll see a lot of people trying to write either orthographically or switching between languages on the fly. I actually do intend to learn the LaSalle theory, the Quebec French, and I'll work through the software in order to be able to switch between English and French as needed. Okay. Can you use Plover with an Apple Mac and connect up a modern day stenograph machine such as the Luminex? Yes. And I've got Mark writing another question. Or maybe not. All right. I think that's all the time that I have today. But I'm online a lot. You can find me at Morin Ted on Twitter. Um, if you check my website, you'll find my email. I'm available on Facebook. And I'm happy to discuss with any of you about where Steno will go and about the different ways to use it. It's been a real pleasure talking to you today. I really wouldn't have expected to be part of StenoFest, but I'm super thrilled to be here. I've been Ted Morin, and once again, just thank you everyone. I hope to see you all at the next StenoFest. <laughs>